teach you a song here real quick before we get going, all right? So we'll sing through it once, you'll catch on, then you'll jump in with us. All right, here we go. Ready? I will rejoice. Oh, I will rejoice. I will dance in your kindness and claim every yes and amen. Oh, I will rejoice. Yes, I will.
stuff happening around here. Why don't you have a seat and learn about all that in Central Now. Hey everyone, let's take a minute and check out ways for you and your family to get involved here at Central this fall. It's Central Now, here we go. Number one, Fall Serve Day. On Saturday, October 16th, we'll gather again as a church family to serve our communities. Now, similar to Central Serve Day, we'll get together with small groups and our families to show the love of Jesus through acts of service. And this fall, we want you to use your creativity and connections. Maybe it looks like a family gathering together to cook for someone. Maybe it's your small group painting a neighbor's deck, or maybe it's just simply going above and beyond to show someone who needs it that they matter. On Saturday, October 16th, you're invited to come to church first for a light breakfast and a kickoff, and then move out into the community. More information and details can be found on your lesson notes or the Central Now app. And serve shirts are at the info desk for you to pick up. Let's set aside a day and be intentional in how we show love to others. And number two, kept gathering. October 16th is a big day here at Central. After a morning of serving, ladies, you're invited for a night of worship just for you. This fall kept gathering will be at 7 p.m. in the worship center with doors opening at 6.30. Come with expectant hearts and make sure to invite your friends. And finally, number three, Thursday community meal. This fall, we're relaunching our Thursday community meal. So if you're interested in cooking, serving, or just loving people right here in Mount Vernon, text me right now at 618-242-4185, and we will plug you into a team that serves once a month. The Thursday community meal is each week from five to six in the cafe and kicks off on November 4th. Let's cook up some relationships in our community. There you go. This fall at Central is packed full of ways that you can serve and produce the fruit of the Spirit. More details and dates can be found on our Facebook page, centralnow.com, or the Central Now app. Now let's transition into a time of offering and communion. Here's middle school pastor, Alicia Smith. Kindness and goodness are the fruits we're talking about this weekend, and uh, we are going to learn more about how we can show those fruits in our own lives. Uh, we, one way that we can do that actually is through our giving. And so that is one of the things we're going to do right now in our worship service. We invite you to give generously, and you can give in the blue boxes located in the tunnels on your way out. You can give online. You can text to give using the number on your screen. However you choose to do it, um, giving is a way not only to show the goodness and kindness um, fruit that God has grown in you, but it's also a very important way to help us spread uh, the good news of Jesus right here and all around the world. Another way that we worship here at Central every weekend is through taking communion. And if you did not receive communion when you came in, go ahead and raise your hand. Someone will bring that to you. We invite everybody here this morning to participate. And if you're worshiping online, uh, make sure that you go ahead and grab those elements so that you can take as well. Hang on to those. You can take them on your own in just a moment after I pray. The bread, of course, represents Jesus' body that was broken for us, and the juice represents his blood. Have you ever played the game called Spot the Difference? Basically, it's just a really simple game where you have two photos side by side. They appear identical at first glance, but a closer look and you can spot some subtle differences, kind of like that one right there. Well, I, I think that if the words kindness and goodness were pictures, I think they would be a perfect duo for a game of Spot the Difference. Because when I hear kindness and goodness, they sound, you know, they're, they're identical somewhat in uh, their characteristics, they're both fruits of the Spirit, they're both share similar qualities, but if you take a closer look, you can start to see that they are a little bit different. Kindness is helpfulness for the sake of being helpful, right? You've heard of random acts of kindness, like holding the door open for someone, paying for the person behind you in the drive through Of course, we know the ultimate expression of kindness was shown by Jesus in Titus chapter 3, it says, when God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, he saved us, not because of the righteous things that we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and a new life through the Holy Spirit. And so at first glance, you might think that those two words could be interchangeable, but I did a little further digging this week, and I came across something that really helped me spot a difference in these two words. Turns out the Greek word for goodness 
implies righteousness, uprightness of, of heart and mind. And so the motivation for goodness is integrity. And so for that reason, the ways that goodness is expressed could look very different from the ways that kindness is expressed. For example, God's goodness might be shown to you through the discipline you receive from your parents. Not exactly enjoyable, but it is good. God's goodness might be shown to you as he closes a door that you were hoping he would open. See, I think sometimes we associate goodness with things that are enjoyable or things that are pleasurable or comfortable. But in reality, sometimes God's goodness is anything but that. Sometimes God's goodness is painful, like when Jesus went to the cross. In his book, The Chronicles of Narnia, Author C.S. Lewis paints this picture of a fictional place called Narnia, which is ruled by the great lion, Aslan. And Aslan um, is, is going to be introduced to one of the characters. Her name is Susan. And there's another character, Mr. Beaver, who's talking to Susan. He's trying to, like, encourage her and tell her about, you know, what to expect when she meets this, this great big lion. And, of course, she's a little nervous about meeting this, this great big lion. And so she asks Mr. Beaver, she says, well, is he safe? And Mr. Beaver replies, safe? Who said anything about being safe? Of course he's not safe, but he is good. And that quote has always stuck with me because it reminds me of the unconventional goodness of our God. See, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, I'm sure that situation did not look good to the people who were standing around that day. As his body was physically deteriorating, I'm sure that did not look good. But in reality, it was the ultimate expression of the goodness of God. It was because Jesus put himself into that unsafe situation that we can now have the hope of the safety of heaven. And so when we take communion today, I want us to remember not only the overwhelming kindness that God has shown us, but also his unconventional goodness that he gives to us. It's because of those things that come from God that we have a way to eternal life, and it's that kindness and goodness that also produces the same fruit in our lives. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your overwhelming kindness and your unconventional goodness that has been shown to us and that is continuing to be shown to us each day. Right now, we especially thank you for your kindness and goodness that was shown to us when you went to the cross and you put yourself in that position so that we could have the hope of the safety and the beauty of heaven someday. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. continue worshiping uh, with our ministry time and ministry time is uh, a prayer time that you can come forward to these steps and pray if you come forward uh, people will join you the, the central family will come alongside you and uh, and pray with you uh, big or small uh, we are praying we are singing to we are worshiping a good a god and a god that cares about uh, your situation so i would encourage you uh, to come forward if you're watching online uh, Jennifer is standing by she would love to pray with you as well so you can uh, send her a message and she'll pray with you and she even shares those with us we get to pray with you as well so we uh, would really encourage you to do that as well but we're going to pray and we're going to sing so I encourage you uh, to stand up bring your needs forward as we stand and sing
God, you're so good. God, you're so
Hey y'all, Farmer Barry here. Today we're talking about goodness and kindness. There ain't no one more good and kind than Miss Barry. Although she ain't real kind after I forget to take my boots off after a long day in the pigsty. Anyways, you know what else is good? The stalk, rind, or skin of a fruit is typically more nutritious than the actual fruit itself. So if you peel your fruits, you might be missing out on some nutrition. Well, this has been your fun fruit fact with Farmer Barry. Take care, you all. The man is so committed to the role that he just bit through the rind of an orange. Jason Berry, whose real name is Jason Berry, Farmer Berry, he works out at Continental, and I heard this week that his department ordered like 30 of these Farmer Berry shirts, <laughs> which is super cool. Hey, 2 Corinthians 9, 8 says, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things and at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. That scripture and a bunch of other scriptures over the course of history have led us to this kind of Christian culture statement that we do back and forth. Let's see if you guys know what I'm talking about. God is good. Okay, a lot of you guys know this is the best service yet. Way to go. I'm going to say God is good. You're going to say all the time. Then I'll say all the time. You say God is good. Let's declare it together. Ready? God is good. And all the time. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. Welcome to Central, everybody. It's great to see you all here today. If you need lesson notes, you can raise your hand. We'll get you some lesson notes right now. Don't forget about that family challenge on the back. And if you're joining us online or on TV, we're so grateful that you are a part of this service as well from wherever you are. I know that there are prayer needs where you are. And just this last week, I had the opportunity, the privilege to pray for four different prayer requests that came in uh, from our online viewers. So if you need some prayer where you are, you can have a private prayer chat with Jennifer, our online host, or uh, you can text that prayer to 618-242-4185, whatever your prayer is today. We would love to join you this week in that. Also, we'd love to see you here in person sometime soon at 301 North 10th Street, right here in Mount Vernon, Illinois. But until then, people in the room, let's welcome all those joining us online and on TV. Hey, you might have seen some stuff floating around social media this week. I want to let you know we have the opportunity, and this is a really great thing. This is a positive thing. We have the opportunity to move from 10 a.m. on WSIL to 9 a.m. on WSIL. So we have made that move. Central is now on the air at 9 a.m. Starting this week, we're on the air at 9 a.m. And this is a really great thing. We just need your help in spreading the word because there are a bunch of people that are watching. We want to make sure everybody knows knows about that change. So if you've never liked Central on Facebook, go like Central on Facebook. You'll find posts like that graphic that was just shown. You can share that. Help us spread the word that we're now on the air at 9 a.m. And praise God for that. It's a super cool opportunity. Okay, let's read our scripture together today. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. I'm excited because you guys are very interactive. I want to hear your voices. Okay, Galatians 5, 22, 23. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our our lives. Come on. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. Way to go. You guys sound great today. Goodness and kindness. That's what we're talking about. They are similar, but like Alicia said really well, they're not, they're not exactly the same. We're going to talk about them together. So we're kind of like picking two fruits at the same time today. So you get that, but they're not exactly the same. They're not interchangeable. They are two things, though, that I think complement each other well. They go together well. They're better together. There's things in life that just shouldn't be together. Like uh, we're getting ready to go back into uh, the baby food era in our house. And if you've ever been down the baby food aisle at the store, you know there are just things that should not be in the same jar together that they have mushed up in like uh, mushed chicken and apples, right? I don't know why that's a thing, but those things probably shouldn't be together. Goodness and kindness though, those are like things that should be together, like, uh, like, like bananas and strawberries. This is kind of like your banana berry section of the fruits of the Spirit. These things are better together. So we're going to talk about what the difference is between goodness and kindness, and more importantly, we're going to look at the importance that they play in the life of a Christian. 
It seems like all of these fruits of the Spirit are kind of sequential, right? The Bible tells us that love is the greatest of all. So love is the first fruit. And then when we have love, it leads us to this true abiding joy. Not necessarily like a happiness thing, but like a Jesus-founded joy. And that leads us to a place where we can have this deep peace. And when we have deep peace, we are able to be more patient with the world around us. And when we have this patience, it gives us the capacity to show kindness. And when we show kindness, it reveals a deeper good. There's a bunch of stories, but there's a guy named Daniel Lebetsky. Daniel grew up hearing stories about his dad's life in a German concentration camp during World War II. It is the horrific scene that we all know. We've seen the documentaries, we've seen the pictures. I mean, people just literally skin and bones dying. His dad was one of those people. His dad was a Jewish prisoner, and of course the conditions were terrible. People literally starving to death. One day, Daniel's dad felt like he was just at the end of his life. He was only a nine-year-old boy, and he felt like he was going to die. And a German soldier, the enemy, shuffled him some food without anybody else seeing it. It was an unexpected act of kindness, but Daniel's dad always remembered that one kind act as something that sustained him in the moment, but even more than that, saved his life. Showing kindness can be like that. It can change a life. It can save a life. And I think this is pretty cool. Today, Daniel Lebetsky is the founder and CEO of, anybody? Kind Bars. That's pretty cool. That's a good backstory. Here you go. I hope you're not allergic to peanuts, Jackson. If you are, pass that down the line. A kind act doesn't make someone good, but a kind act should point us toward what is ultimately good, and what is ultimately good is God alone. We're going to find that out as we go through this today. Write this down. Godly kindness leads us to God's goodness. Godly kindness leads us to God's goodness. So there's kindness and goodness. We hear about it all the time. Let's talk about what exactly this fruit of the Spirit looks like. This kind of kindness, I think Alicia did a good job defining this as well. This is, kindness is associated with like generosity, gentleness, care, compassion. I think godly kindness is uh, real connected to like mercy and uh, love. The Bible even says that love, uh, kind is part of love. You remember 1 Corinthians 13, 4 says, love is patient and kind. So you have to have kindness to show God's love. Goodness, on the other hand, is more of an inside thing, like an internal state. Goodness would involve like integrity, honesty, uprightness. I think Alicia said righteousness. It's a character thing. So as the Holy Spirit lives in us and fills us with the fruit of the Spirit, as he's producing goodness and kindness, there should be something happening on the inside and on the outside of us. So write this down. Kindness is caring. Goodness is godness. Kindness is caring. Goodness is godness. It's developing this godlikeness in us. Because ultimately... The truest form of good, the greatest good that there is, is God. The Bible says that God is all-powerful. He created everything with a word. He could wipe us out with a breath. But he doesn't do that because ultimately he is good. The Bible says that his authority is frightening. The power he has is frightening. But ultimately his heart is good. We need to have that knowledge in our head, and we find it in his word all over the place. First Chronicles 16.34 says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Psalm 25.8, Good and upright is the Lord. Mark 10.18, Only God is truly good. That's what Jesus said. So what does that mean when it doesn't feel like that? Sometimes God allows us to go through seasons where he corrects us like a parent with a child. It doesn't change who he is. God is still good. He lets us go through life and learn lessons the hard way sometimes, but it doesn't change anything. God is still good. Even when it doesn't feel like it, God at his core is still good. Like Diana said a few weeks ago in that interview, even when we don't think that God is good, it doesn't change a thing. God is good all the time, no matter what happens, at the core of his character, he is good. 
So as we try to be more like God, as we try to be good, it should motivate us toward kindness. Saul was the first king of Israel. Saul's son was Jonathan. Jonathan's best friend was David. David had been anointed as the next king of Israel. So you can imagine there's some awkward family dinners for Jonathan, right? His, his dad is the current king. His best friend is the anointed next king. So there's this tension in the house. Saul, the current king, feels threatened and he goes mad actually and tries to kill David a bunch of times. So Jonathan and David, his best friend, make this covenant with each other in 1 Samuel chapter 20 that they make this agreement. They're going to look out for each other's interests above all else. They're going to even care for one another's families after one of them dies. So Saul current king, and his son, Jonathan, end up dying in battle. David, who was anointed to be the next king, becomes king. Years down the road, David is thinking back and he remembers this promise, this covenant that he had made with his best friend, Jonathan. And so he sends for a guy whose name is Ziba. Ziba was uh, a servant in Saul, the, the former king, in Saul's household. So Ziba comes in and King David says this, Is anyone still alive from Saul's family? If so, I want to show God's kindness to them. Ziba replied, yes, one of Jonathan's sons is still alive. He's crippled in both feet. Where is he? The king asked. In Lodabar, Ziba told him, at the home of Makir, son of Emil. So there's one person left in the bloodline. His name is Mephibosheth. He is Jonathan's son. He's Saul's grandson. And we see here and we read earlier in the book that he had been dropped when he was younger and because of that he was physically disabled and now he's living in this place called Lodabar and Lodabar was like a low income impoverished area. So you can sense Ziba's hesitation when he answers the king, right? The king says, is there anybody left from that bloodline? And and Ziba says, yeah, but he's, I mean, he's crippled so he can't really do anything to you. Yeah, but he he lives in Lodabar and I mean, we all all know about Lodabar Lodabar. He's not even living in his own house. He's living in somebody else's house. So he's not really worth anything to you. And then David says, I I don't care. Bring him in anyways. Okay. So you got to picture this, right? Mephibosheth, who has been living, uh, living a life uh, far away from royalty. I mean, he was, he was no longer part of this royal household. He's living in somebody else's house with his family in a, in a, in a junk town and he's crippled. And so he's in this house and all of a sudden there's this strong knock on the door and they open it up and there's these towering royal guards and they say, we're here to get Mephibosheth. Is it, can he come out? And you know that in that moment, he's thinking, this is it. This is the end. I mean, they, they have wiped out. It's customary in those days to wipe out everybody from the kingdom, the king's bloodline before you, right? And so he thinks, this is it. I'm the last one left. This is the end for me. And so they take Mephibosheth to King David. Mephibosheth still doesn't know what's going on. And he comes in. He's trembling. Here's what we read in, the, in, in verse 7. Don't be afraid, David said. I I intend to show you kindness because of my promise to your father, Jonathan. I'll give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will eat here with me at the king's table. Mephibosheth bowed respectfully and exclaimed, Who is your servant that you would show such kindness to a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Saul's servant Ziba and said, I've given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and servants are to farm the land for him to produce food for your master's household. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, will eat here at my table. Ziba replied, yes, my lord, the king, I am your servant and I will do all that you have commanded. And from that time on, Mephibosheth ate regularly at King David's table like one of the king's own sons. So David brings him in and feeds him and treats him like royalty, even though by all accounts, he's somebody that he should have just killed. He probably should have just wiped him out to preserve his own dynasty. Later, there's part of this story where Mephibosheth, despite all that David had done, Mephibosheth might even have betrayed David, but David brings him back in and gives him a second chance and welcomes him back into the presence of the king to eat with him just like family. Mephibosheth, undeserving, unable to repay, 
but a real recipient of David's unmerited mercy. Mephibosheth ends up living this lavish life that he had nothing to do with. He didn't do anything to create this for himself. It was completely because of the kindness of David. And David's kindness came because of the covenant that he had made with Jonathan. He was making good, holding true to the promise and the covenant that he had made with Jonathan years before. Does this sound familiar? Is this an example of maybe Old Testament foreshadowing what is to come? Does this storyline kind of seem like it's familiar? Well, it should because, get this, the second half of the Bible, the Bible is kind of in two halves. There's the Old Testament and the New Testament. The New Testament is the part about Jesus coming to earth to make a way for us to go to heaven. The New Testament is also called the New Testament covenant. It's called the new covenant because it revolves around God making an agreement or a promise, a covenant with us, mankind, humanity, to not wipe us out, not wipe out our bloodline, but to forgive our sins, restore a right relationship with anyone who accepts Jesus as their Savior, to welcome us into a lavish love, a lavish life that we have done nothing to earn on our own. David's kindness toward Mephibosheth was because of his covenant with Jonathan. God's kindness toward us comes from his innate goodness and from the covenant that he formed with us. And that covenant centers on Jesus Christ. That's why it is so important for us to take communion so often and to remember the sacrifice because that is the center point of this entire faith. That's what our faith revolves around and stands on. We use this scripture a lot in communion, but it helps to enforce this point. Luke 22, 19 and 20 says this. He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then here it is, verse 20. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. When we eat the bread and we drink the juice, we remember this covenant. We remember the sacrifice, the blood that was poured out of Jesus' body on the cross. That was to cover the sins of many, and that is you and me. It's his life, his death on the cross, his blood. It's his resurrection that is the basis of this promise. And you and I are the beneficiaries of the promise. Undeserving, unable to repay, recipients of unmerited mercy from the Most High. God's kindness extended in our direction. And that's the thing about God's kindness versus any other kindness, right? God's kindness is shown to the ones who are not necessarily lovable, not deserving of love, can't really give you anything in return. And I can think of so many examples of that kind of love being given within the body of Christ. One of the examples that I can think of of that kind of love is my mom who takes care of my sister Amanda who has Down syndrome. And she does all kinds of things to help her through life with never a thank you, never. I mean, there's, there's nothing that she gets back in return other than she's doing it to show kindness. Not any kindness, but God's kindness. God is good. That's, that's who he is. And the opposite of good is evil. And so our sin, our evil sin, by its very nature, creates this divide between us and God. But God knew that that was going to happen. And so that's why he extended his kindness. He showed his kindness in our direction through the life of Jesus to bridge this divide so that we could have a way to have this eternal relationship with him. And he did it certainly at a time when we didn't deserve it because there would never be a time when we would deserve it. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse 6. When we were utterly helpless, that's us, utterly helpless, can't do anything to repay, can't do anything that means anything to God as far as earning his love or his kindness. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who's especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. 
Since we have been made right with God in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because of our Lord Jesus Christ who has made us friends with God. We always say that relationships matter most because they lead us to the relationship that matters the most. This is the relationship that matters the most and that is why we can have that relationship because God extended his kindness toward us through Jesus. God is that good that when we were still his enemy, we were divided from him by our very own sin. God is that good that he made a way through something that cost him so much. And he wants us to follow his example in that and everything else in life. Luke 6, 27, 28 says, But to you who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who hurt you. Don't just pray for the people who love you. Don't just do good to the people who can give you something in return or are going to benefit you in some way. Love those who hate you. Pray for those who hurt you. Like the enemy who gave food and saved the life of Daniel Lebetsky's dad. Like David who welcomed in Mephibosheth, the person who could offer him nothing in return. Like God who gave his most precious son, his most valuable asset, just so that we could eat at his table in the king's presence for all eternity. God is good. His kindness The whole reason for it, the reason for Jesus coming to earth in the first place, that kindness serves one purpose, and that is to draw our hearts toward him. His kindness shown through Jesus is designed to draw our hearts to him. Romans 2.4 says this, don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? The whole reason for it, the whole reason for God's kindness expressed through Jesus is to make a way for us to have that relationship, to make a way for us to know God and know his goodness. So I've got a couple of questions for you today. One, have you acknowledged that whatever the season, high, low, good, bad, that God is ultimately good? His core is good. And have you responded to his goodness and his kindness by giving him your life? Have you committed your life to following him, accepted Jesus as your savior? If not, I would love to have that conversation with you. If you're watching on TV or online, you can call or text right now, 618-242-4185. And we'll start that conversation right now about how you can accept Jesus as your savior as well. Don't let this day pass without making that a reality in your life. Last week, I was so encouraged because last week people responded to Jesus and God's kindness through Jesus by giving their lives and being baptized. Last week, just just right here in this baptistry, six people gave their lives and were baptized right here. Cassie, way to go. Praise God for that. Second, how are you showing God's kindness to the world around you. God wants us to show our love, to show his kindness to the world around us. Remember 1 John 3, 18, dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth. Let us show our love. Let us show kindness by our actions. Most of the time in life when we miss an opportunity, it's not because the opportunity wasn't there, it's because our eyes weren't open to see the opportunity. So I'm encouraging you today to open your eyes to opportunities God is putting in your way to be kind to the world around you. Not just any kind of kindness, but God's kindness for you to show to the world around you. Maybe it's in your job, maybe it's in your home. Uh Uh-oh, that could be the toughest one of all, right? Maybe it's in your home or your job or your neighborhood. Maybe it's right here in the church. Of course, we want everybody to be serving, but you got to look for opportunities. Sarah and I 
were at another church in Missouri a couple of months ago, and we were sitting there through the service, and Sarah had a real bad headache all day, and so she left about halfway through. And then after the service, the lady who was sitting behind us, I mean, she wasn't a staff member, she wasn't a volunteer, she was just a lady in the pew, tapped me on the shoulder, and she said, hey, I noticed that your wife had to leave early. Is, is she feeling okay? And I said, no, she's got, she's got a headache. And she said, hey, would you tell me her name so I can be praying for her by name today and praying that God will help her through the rest of the day? And I thought, my goodness, that is just such a, a kind gesture, right? God's kind of kindness. So it could be a big thing. It could be a little thing like that, that God wants to use you to show his kindness to somebody else. Another opportunity you heard about on Central Now, Jared mentioned uh, that we've got a serve day coming up next Saturday, October 16th. Uh, I'd love to see so many of you, everybody involved in this serve day, October 16th. Uh, we're going to have breakfast here at 7.30 in the morning, 7.30 to 8.30, and then we'll pray in here. You can go out into the community and do whatever your project is. This is different than the serve day that we have in the spring because uh, in the spring, we ask you to sign up for some projects. Right now, what we're asking you to do is to get your friends, the people that you're connected with, your family, and come up with your own project. You guys know your community. You know the world. What do the people around you need? I don't know what it looks like. Maybe it's painting or mowing. Maybe it's calling somebody. Maybe it's visiting somebody. Maybe it's baking some stuff. Just showing the love, showing the kindness of God in the name of Jesus to the community around us. Maybe you're not in a group, that's okay. Show up and Jared will plug you in to a project of some sort. It's not gonna be anything glamorous. There's a real good chance we'll give you a pair of gloves and a trash bag and say, hey, go, go clean up the community. But whatever it is, the heart behind it is showing compassionate kindness to the world around. Not just any kindness, but the kindness of God. David showed kindness to Mephibosheth. God shows kindness to us through Jesus. And you need to know this. God wants to show kindness through you to the world around. That's why his Holy Spirit is filling us. Anyone who believes in Jesus as their Savior has the Holy Spirit living in us. And that's what these fruits are all about. It's the evidence of God's indwelling within us, producing things like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That is the evidence of God living within us. Why don't you stand up? I'm going to pray. And then we're going to go out into the community and show some kindness today. God, thank you for the opportunity that you give us to show kindness to the world in your name. Would you fill us with your spirit and show it through the evidence of goodness and kindness this week and all the other fruits of the spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody says, Amen. come on, you're with me. Here we go. God is good. All and all the time. Have a great week, everybody.